Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals but without all the voodoo. I'm back for another video at headquarters, my collaboration with Head Audio to tell you all about speakers, speaker designs and showing you things that I couldn't do on my own. In this video I want to talk about desk reflections or rather the desk reflection filter but before we get started, just quickly, if you're considering purchasing a head speaker, have a look at the link in the description. There's a link that will support me and both head audio, obviously, if you buy through that link. And if you want to watch the rest of the videos in this series, have a look at the playlist in the card. But let's get back talking about desk reflections or rather the desk reflection filter. I don't know about you guys, but whenever I see a desk reflection option on the back of the speaker, I don't find it particularly inspiring. How is that supposed to work in practice? Does it even work? Let's find out. What is the desk reflection even in practice? What does it actually do to the sound? Well, the desk reflection is pretty much what, what the name suggests. So we get the direct sound coming out of the speaker, but then obviously there's a big surface right in the path underneath that reflection or underneath that direct sound. And sound will bounce off of that and back to the ear as well. So just like with any other type of reflection, that reflected sound bouncing back to your ear will interfere with the direct sound, creating a comb filter. And in practice, when we measure this, we see it both in time as a peak in the impulse response or rather the energy time curve. And we also see the resulting comb filter in the frequency response to some degree, because it obviously depends on just how strong that reflection is, how loud it is. It depends on how far it has to travel in relation to the direct sound. And depending on how much treatment you have in the room, you'll really only see that comb filter appear to the degree that other reflections, other comb filters don't mask it and kind of mess it up, destroy it, if you will, right? So with that, let's have a look and see if we can demonstrate this in practice. All right, so I've once again got smart up here which is the real-time FFT measurement software that allows us to measure and show effects in real time. So to start off, I've got the microphone and the speakers once again set up in our standard kind of listening position geometry. And I'm just going to start and show you what this looks like just in this standard setup. So a couple of things to note here. First of all, in the energy time curve, it's not crazy obvious, but there's a peak right behind the peak that represents the direct sound. That is the desk reflection reflecting back to the microphone. And the comb filter that it creates is pretty obvious when we look at these upper frequencies right here. So I can smooth the response even further and see if we can make this even more obvious, right? So we've got a dip, a peak, a dip, and then it just continues on. That's the effect of the desk reflection. So now what I can do is take this lovely piece of acoustic foam and put that in the path of the reflection, absorbing it to the largest degree. And I can do that in real time to show you how both the peak and the comb filter disappears when we get rid of that reflection. So let's do that now. So 
So if you didn't see that in real time, let's just recap it again here. So this was the measurement before. We had that peak, which was roughly 0.6 milliseconds after the direct sound with the associated comb filter in place as well, right here, sort of with the, the first big dip at around, what is that, maybe 800, 900 hertz, big peak afterwards, followed by kind of the, the compact comb filter as it so happens. But here's what happened when I put the acoustic foam on the desk. First of all, notice how that peak in the energy time curve basically disappeared. And with that, so did the associated dip and peak of the comb filter. Of course, there's still some stuff happening here. There are still tons of reflections in this room, so it's not gonna even out completely, but that's what the desk reflection does. That's as good as I can show it to you right here under these circumstances. So that's what the desk reflection does, but what options do we have to actually get rid of it or to reduce its effect? Well, there are really only two practical options. There's a bunch more that are kind of worth experimenting with, but basically there are two options in practice. Either we can use EQ or we change the geometry of the speaker and desk combination so that that reflection doesn't actually lead back to the ear and cause the interference in the first place. But let's talk about the EQ first because that's what the desk reflection filter in the speaker does. And the thing is, how well can you actually make this work? We saw that the desk reflection causes a comb filter, so it's a bunch of peaks and dips. If you really wanted to reverse that effect, you'd have to implement a very precise filter that combats those exact peaks and dips. But in practice, that's not really possible. One reason is just that the reflection obviously still happens even if you change how much energy you put into those different frequencies. So it's not really something that you can effectively just EQ out. And the other problem is that how are you going to tune this filter precisely to all the different potential kind of scenarios, circumstances in which this desk reflection happens? Because you have to pick the right frequencies and you have to pick the right amplitude for these filters to do what they're supposed to do. So in practice, speaker manufacturers do something different. What they do is that they implement a simple parametric EQ dip that is aimed at the lowest peak that the comb filter creates. So this is usually even below the first dip, right? Because the in-phase component of the reflection just causes a, a boost towards the lower frequencies. And that is usually the strongest and most kind of offensive part of the desk reflection. So speaker manufacturers simply base how they tune that filter, how they tune that EQ on experience and experimentation, and then try and implement a parametric filter, a parametric EQ dip that should work reasonably well in most circumstances. In the case of the HEAD MK2 series, this is a parametric EQ centered around 180 hertz. And you can kind of step it down, you can increment how strong that dip actually is. With that also comes a slight change in the Q factor, so in the, the width of the filter, if you will, just so that it kind of works better with all the different circumstances out there basically, right? So let's see what that actually looks like in practice. On the speaker itself, once again, it's just another toggle switch, if you will, a rotary encoder. It's the desk filter, and we have the option of off, small, medium, and large. These basically represent three different scenarios with different desk sizes ranging for something that we like, like what we have here, to slightly bigger kind of production desks, to proper huge mixing consoles. That's kind of how it's thought to work, how it's kind of intended to work. So let's turn the speaker back and just measure these three responses and see how they actually affect the frequency response. So let's start this and I'm just gonna show it to you in real time.
basically with every step of the desk reflection filter we're seeing a drop in level around kind of the 180 hertz mark yeah so that would be somewhere around here and that's really all it does in this case and to be honest with just about any desk reflection filter implemented in the speaker right it's a it's a solution focused on that lowest part of the spectrum just to kind of reduce the boominess of that part of the spectrum the one thing that it doesn't do obviously is get rid of the actual peak right so with none of these measurements we actually see the peak in the impulse response get reduced. I'm just going to switch these off and start with the top. So paying attention to that peak at around 6.7 milliseconds total without compensation, but about 0.8 milliseconds after the direct sound. Watch what happens as I switch through the measurements of the different reflection filters. So this is as it was in the uncompensated state. Here's what the small option does. Here's the medium option. And here the large option. Compare that to putting the actual acoustic foam on the desk. So it is also just a solution directly aimed at the frequency response. It doesn't affect the time response. And how can it, right? If the speaker plays sound, the desk reflection will happen. So if the actual desk reflection filter in the speaker can't get rid of the desk reflection happening and that peak in the impulse response, as I mentioned before, the only real way to get rid of this desk reflection is to change the speaker and desk geometry by basically moving the speaker far enough back behind the desk so that it creates enough distance to the desk you create an angle that is so shallow that the reflection doesn't lead back to the listening position now in practice this isn't really something you can do in your home studio unless your room is very big you need enough space in order to do that while not giving up your listening position and not giving up your stereo image and your sound stage right so this is something that is usually reserved for bigger rooms with more space and proper treatment proper reflection control around the setup in order for that very large geometry to really work but even if this isn't something we would do in a room this size i can still show you how that works by just pulling the microphone back from the desk. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna put on the measurement and then I'm just gonna pull back the microphone and I want you to watch what happens to that peak in the impulse response and the resulting comb filter in the frequency response. So let's check that out. So have a look at just how well that worked, right? So this is the original measurement with the desk reflection in place. But then as I pulled back the speaker, obviously the volume changed, the timing overall changed, which is why that peak moved. But the peak of the desk reflection disappeared just like it did when I placed the acoustic foam on the table. And with it, the associated comb filter got removed as well. So that's really the only way to properly get rid of the desk reflection. It's a combination of speaker and desk positioning that allows you to change that angle so that it never leads back to the listening position in the first place. So obviously this isn't exactly the same kind of layout that you would have when you move your speakers back from your desk, right? When you actually want to do this, what happens is that your listening position and your desk stay in place and the speakers just move back. 
And here I did kind of the opposite. The speakers and the desk stayed and I moved the microphone back. So it's not the exact same, but the principle is still the same, right? We want to reduce that reflection angle, make it so shallow that it doesn't lead back to the ear. And whether we do that by moving the microphone back or actually moving the speakers back, the effect is pretty much the same, at least to demonstrate what actually happens. So those are really our two options to do something about the desk reflection. Either we use the desk reflection filter, that is a kind of one size fits all generic parametric EQ dip to apply to the kind of upper bass, lower mid frequencies to reduce some of the boominess, or we do it properly and we change the actual geometry, which is something that is really reserved for bigger rooms. So to wrap up and to go back to the original question, how well do these desk reflection filters work? Well, they work as well as the implementation is intended to work. And it's not really a desk reflection filter as such, right? It doesn't intend to remove the complete comb filter that the desk reflection creates. Instead, it's more of a kind of low mid high bass boominess reducer, if you will which can appear not just when you're placing your speakers close to your desk, but also just close to other surfaces. In small rooms, there are all sorts of kind of placement scenarios where you can create a bit of boominess, a bit of too much energy in that kind of low, mid, high bass region. So because of that, don't really see it as a technical desk reflection reducing parameter or rather when you do implement it in your studio when you do kind of play with the desk reflection filter do it by ear basically listen to some music listen to the sound from the speakers and kind of go through those different steps in the filter to see which one creates the most natural sound because it is a one-size-fits-all filter and it won't always perfectly fit with your particular scenario. So it's something you just kind of have to experiment with and then figure out which version exactly works best for you. So with that, let me once again remind you that I've also got a brand new workshop, The Phantom Speaker Test, how to set up your speakers correctly no matter what room you're in. This is my full process to place your speakers, to place your listening position correctly in your room, in your home studio, even under this kind of sort of odd circumstances. If you've got a door in an odd place, a window in an odd place, there's some weird geometry. How do you deal with that? How do you figure out exactly where to place your setup? That's what this workshop is all about, to get the best response from your speakers, to get an even low end, to get a sound stage and a phantom center that sounds like you're working on headphones. This is the Phantom Speaker Test and you can get access at the link in the description. In that, I also cover how to use the EQ on the back of your speakers correctly. How do you use the low shelf, the high shelf, the desk reflection filter? At what point in the process of setting up your speakers do you want to actually look at those? So again, if you're setting up a new studio, have a look at the Phantom Speaker Workshop at the link in the description. I hope you got something out of this video. I always think it's interesting to see what implementations are very kind of concrete and give you definite results and which are more broad solutions that you just have to kind of tweak by ear. This is definitely one of those. And with that, let's get back to trusting our ears and having fun working on music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.